Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Yesudian, a consultant dermatologist based in the UK. Today I thought I will review a condition that is seen fairly commonly, especially as we grow older. It's called idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis and manifests as small white marks on the skin, particularly in the upper and lower limbs. It's commonly mistaken for vitiligo and can cause anxiety when it is first noted. Idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis is an acquired cause of reduced pigmentation on the skin that is typically present in early adult life. It is seen in about 20% of those who are below the age of 30 and the rate goes up to as high as 80% in those above the age of 70, particularly in Southeast Asia. It affects both males and females equally. The exact cause is uncertain. Genetics may play a role as those with a positive family history are at higher risk of developing it. Ultraviolet light may also be a contributory factor. Areas around the lesion show histopathological changes of solar damage that strengthen the role of cumulative sun exposure. Gradual decrease in melanocyte count and density as we age also contributes to this problem. Finally, trauma may also play a part. It is seen more commonly in areas having less subcutaneous tissue that are susceptible to trauma such as the anterior aspect of the shins. It typically presents in adult life and it is characterized by multiple asymptomatic, well-defined, round to oval, depigmented or hypopigmented areas of skin, approximately 0.5 to 5 millimeters in diameter. Usually these lesions do not enlarge. In younger individuals, the lesions are scanty, usually less than 5 in number and not larger than 2 millimeters. But in those above 50 years of age, lesions are numerous, maybe 30 to 50, and larger measuring three to five millimeters. So how do we manage this condition? We can classify treatments into lifestyle measures, topical agents and interventional procedures. It's mainly a cosmetic problem and it tends to be asymptomatic. So general advice can include education of the nature and course of the condition as it enables those who have the condition to have a proper understanding of the entity with realistic outcomes. Avoidance of trauma and sun protection may be beneficial. A few topical agents have been known to be helpful. Topical calcineurin inhibitors appear to be a promising treatment option. Studies have shown that 1% pimecrolimus cream and 0.1% tacrolimus ointment can be helpful in repigmentation. They can be applied once or twice a day over the affected area. We need to avoid excessive sun exposure and apply sunscreens during the stipulated time. Minor transient side effects like burning sensation can occur. A major drawback is the prolonged duration of therapy of at least six months. In another study, topical tretinoin demonstrated noticeable clinical improvement at two months with disappearance of some lesions after four months of treatment. The recommendation is to apply topical tretinoin 0.025% for one week, increase to 0.05% and then escalate to 0.1% till the appearance of significant repigmentation. Maintenance therapy is recommended for a uh, durable effect. There are quite a few interventional treatments that can also be tried, but these tend to have more potential side effects and can cause more loss of pigmentation sometimes. So we need to be very prudent in choosing these and patients need to be aware of a possible worsening of the reduced color of the skin. Isolated use of intralesional steroids as a therapeutic option can be tried with careful monitoring of adverse side effects like skin thinning. Modalities like application of phenol or trichloroacetic acid, cryosurgery with liquid nitrogen spray, dermabrasion, needling and laser ablation all work on the principle of therapeutic wounding with secondary post-inflammatory pigmentation from the controlled trauma. Let's look at some of the chemicals used for this condition. Both 50% trichloroacetic acid and 88% phenol have been shown to be effective. I was very happy to note that the use of trichloroacetic acid was reported just a few weeks ago in the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology by Maya Vedamurthy and her colleagues from Chennai. With the help of cotton buds, they applied 0.5% of trichloroacetic acid, feathering up to one millimeter of normal skin around the lesion. The end point was uniform frosting of the treated area that appeared in 30 seconds. Following this procedure, all patients were advised to apply 2% mucorosin cream twice daily for 7 to 10 days. Crust formation may occur which sheds off within 7 to 10 days. From the 10th day, the patient was advised daily sun exposure for 5 to 10 minutes. Repigmentation occurred within 4 to 6 weeks. 
Cryotherapy is a relatively fast, cost-effective, and minimally invasive procedure. There have been reports of repigmentation in more than 90% of treated lesions after 6 to 8 weeks. Apply a single session of liquid nitrogen with a cryoprobe for about 3 to 5 seconds. Do not spray too fast as it may cause deeper cryo-injury leading to scarring. Repigmentation is seen as early as 4 weeks. However, a certain degree of expertise is required and it can cause scarring that could worsen the reduced pigmentation. Superficial derm abrasion is an effective surgical option for resistant idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis to be performed under expert supervision. However, persistent post-procedure erythema is a possible outcome. Fractional CO2 laser is a novel, safe and effective therapeutic addition. However, the high cost and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation are some limitations. Ergium YAG laser is a good treatment choice in dark-skinned individuals. The major drawback is the high cost and restricted availability. Autologous mini-grafting with and without intralesional steroids have also been reported to be helpful. However, the numbers are small and the evidence for its use is very limited and currently, therefore, it is not recommended. In summary, even though idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis is harmless, patients often seek dermatological consultation due to cosmetic concerns. The primary step is to educate patients as they are possibly worried about vitiligo. Reassuring them curbs their anxieties. We need to advise regarding photoprotection and avoidance of trauma. If deemed necessary, topical calcineurin inhibitors and retinoids may be tried. 50% trichloristic acid and cryotherapy could also be considered. In resource-rich settings, non-ablative fractional erbium laser may be effective and well-tolerated. I hope you found this information helpful. Thank you for listening and bye.